Please stand to your feet out of love and respect for the public reading of Scripture. The title of my message today on Super Bowl Sunday, No Cure for Being Human. And I'll be reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. And here is the word of the Lord. You have heard that our ancestors were told, this is Jesus talking, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. So, if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, then come and offer your sacrifice to God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the words of our Savior. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the most important sermon ever preached, Sermon on the Mount. Thank you for the spiritual truth that you shared then and how it still relates to us now. And so we ask, Holy Spirit, bring interpretation and understanding to our hearts and minds that we might move closer in our relationship with God the Father. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray and everyone said, amen. You may be seated. So here's the main idea from, for the message today. Is there no cure for being human. Now, Jesus had a lot to say about our humanity here in the most important sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. And he indicates in the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount that spiritual progress begins when we are able to admit when we are wrong. You know, American culture has popular theories on how to build the perfect life. Kate Bowler is a professor of history of Christianity at Duke University And she makes this observation in the preface of her book, No Cure for Being Human, where I got the title of the message from, from the title of her book. And she has seen many guides to human progress on sale in airport kiosks, uh, books written by spiritual guides and uh, spiritual gurus, uh, motivational self-help books that challenge you to take wild action with your life, climb a mountain, you know, uh, uh, go, go uh, scuba diving, walk on burning coals, bark at the moon, whatever it takes to reach your full potential as a human. And then there are therapeutic books. Some are, are really good. They introduce creative perspectives and enhance techniques to a better life. These all may help, they all might help, But none of these books address the heart of the issue. And the heart of the problem is the problem in the heart. And only God can deal with the problem in the heart, which is our fallen nature, which is sin. So the only cure for our humanness is the gospel of Jesus Christ itself. Jesus knew this, which is why he included so many examples of human imperfection in the Sermon on the Mount, such as committing murder, being angry with a brother, committing adultery, looking at a person with lust. Paul, the apostle, picked up on this theme in his writings to Timothy. He said, in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves and lovers of pleasure, and they will be unholy, and they will be unthankful. And he gives this long list. In another occasion, he says uh, that things will get worse and worse. The evil people will continue to deceive and being deceived as we near the approach of the coming of Christ. In in Romans 1, he said, matter of fact, a whole generation will be turned over to a reprobate mind. So humans are complicated, to say the least. Uh, And Jesus addresses that when he refers to murder and anger and revenge and adultery. Speaking of which, did you hear about the woman who was at the bedside of her dying husband in the hospital? And before he was to die, he said, I have something to confess. And she said, shh, not now, not now. He said, no, 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 but I need to tell you that I've cheated on you many times. And she she says, yes, I know that. You know that? I know that. He says, well, I I want my conscience to be clear before I die. And she says, shh, 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 just lie back and let the poison do its work. (laughs) Murder, adultery, revenge, right? Now, neither Paul or or Jesus are down on human beings. And before Kate Bowler wrote her book, Is There No Cure, Cure for Humanity?, the Bible knew that the only cure for humanity was outside of humanity. The only cure for our humanness is God's grace, his mercy, which is undeserving. 
It's only by the power of Christ and the gospel through the Holy Spirit that we could actually begin to change, to become better human beings. And the remedy for our humanity, according to Jesus and really the entirety of the Bible, it begins with honesty, being honest with God, being honest with ourselves, and being honest with others. We have to learn how to repent. We have to learn how to say, I was wrong. We have to learn how to turn the other cheek. That doesn't come naturally to us. We have to learn how to love our neighbor. We have to learn how to pray for those who persecute us. And all of that is what is included in the shortest sermon ever recorded, in the most, in the most important sermon ever recorded, the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, in chapter 5, I believe verse 44, Jesus even says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be perfect. Well, it's not perfection like you and I think of perfection. Only Jesus was flawless. Only Jesus was blameless. Only Jesus was perfect. But the Greek word for the word perfection, when Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, later on the Apostle Paul said, be imitators of God as dearly loved children in Ephesians 5.1. The word perfect in the Greek it actually has this meaning. Our progress towards perfection basically is a commitment to a path of growth that leads to maturity. Are you committed to be on a path of growth that leads to your maturity? All of us as Jesus people, as followers of Christ, need to intentionally be committed to a path of growth that leads to maturity. That's why we come to church. That's why we go to Bible study groups. That's why we read our Bibles. That's why we have devotional times. That's why 100% of your listening to music cannot be secular music. You need, you need to balance it with worship music. You need to be feeding your soul and feeding your spirit, and you need to be committed personally, personally to a growth, to a path of growth that leads to maturity. And how does that happen? Well, this is a nine-week course, but you want to get home and watch the Super Bowl tonight, so I'm going to give it to you in 15 minutes that we have left, all right? Three thoughts. The first is this, admission. If you want to commit to be on a path of growth that leads to maturity, number one, you have to practice admission. You have to begin to practice and admitting when you are wrong. And friend, it takes courage to admit you're wrong. Any coward can blame others. Now, there might be times you're completely, totally right. Look at Job 27.5. Here's what Job said. Far be it from me to admit that you're right. I intend to maintain my integrity if it kills me. I think he was talking to his wife in that chapter. That's... <laughs> nah, he wasn't. He was talking to his friends who were falsely accusing him of something that he literally was innocent of. So yes, there are rare occasions when you are completely innocent. And you can't admit to a wrong that you didn't com commit. But most of the times, you know, one of the most liberating, powerful things you could do in a marriage, husbands, is to admit to your wife, I was wrong. Let's practice right now. If you're here with your spouse, guys, just turn to her right now. As hard as it's going to be to say, I was wrong. <laughs> now, see, that's not that hard, was it? That's and that's music to a wife's ears. And you don't want to add this, I was wrong this time, but most of the time you know it's you know, you're wrong. <laughs> that doesn't work. Now you're back into the problem. Our relationships actually suffer severely for this one, per this one reason, our reluctance to admit when we're wrong. Admitting you're wrong, friend, can actually make you strong. It's, it's really as simple as that. To your supervisor, to your boss, to your employer, to a friend, to a spouse, to a, a girlfriend or boyfriend. Hey, I was wrong. I had a human moment. We all do make mistakes. Now, Jesus, he took the blame and he took our shame and nailed it to the cross. And he never tried to defend that he was blameless. Here's the, the sinless son of God who never committed a flaw, never committed a sin, never sinned, flawless, perfect, our perfect Savior, and yet he took the blame. Your blame, my blame, your shame, my shame, and he never tried to defend himself. There actually is a, uh, a psychological reason behind this, not just a theological reason. Uh, Carol Tavris is the eminent social psychologist from Los Angeles, and she ex calls it and explains it as cognitive dissonance. And I'm going to quote her just because this is a fun quote, right? 
Cognitive dissonance is the motivational mechanism that underlines the profoundly human reluctance to admit mistakes. What did she say? It, basically, it takes a strong man and a strong woman to admit when they're wrong. And because we are unable to admit we're wrong, it's because we're suffering from cognitive dissonance. So what's wrong with the world? I'll tell you what's wrong with the world. I'm what's wrong with the world. You are what's wrong with the world. If we want to change the world, we need to begin by letting God change us to be more kind, thoughtful, prayerful, compassionate, giving people. And that's why I believe humility is most likely the greatest attribute that makes us more like Jesus. Humility. In Matthew, 20, in Matthew 5, verses 25 and 26, again, when you are on the way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. Are you in a court case right now? Maybe that's a word of the Lord for you. Get out of it as quickly as you possibly can. Cut your losses and move on with your life. Sometimes that's the best advice. Otherwise, your accusers may hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to the officer and you'll be thrown in prison. And if that happens, you surely won't be free again until you have paid the last penny. For those of you that are in the medical profession, those of you that are doctors, this research is out there and just take it for granted. I'm telling you the truth. I don't have time to, to back up what I'm about to say, but Google it and you'll find the research for yourself. Doctors are discovering if you want to be sued less, talk more to your patients, that is. By simply having a human connection with your patients, by talking with your patients, you can actually minimize lawsuits. They are, are discovering that when a hospital or a doctor actually makes a mistake and they actually own it and they say, we're sorry, we made a mistake. Less doctors and hospitals are being sued and the evidence is out there. So what's Jesus saying? In making an admission that you made a mistake, confession, it actually builds trust. Confession brings people together. And that's why it's important for us to admit when we are wrong, to ask for, con uh, for forgiveness. Now, don't miss this. Being honest with ourselves, with God, and with others according to Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, is the key to avoiding other more serious problems in our life, such as murder and adultery and lust and being an oath breaker. So admission is key. Matter of fact, John says, he that says he has no sin is a liar. All right? First John tells us that. We all have sin. We're all flawed human beings. And in order for our relationships to not just survive but thrive, we have to be quick to admit when we're wrong and ask for forgiveness. The second thought is this. If we want to commit to a path of spiritual growth that leads to maturity, number one, it takes admission. Number two, we have to practice the ministry of reconciliation. In verse 23 and 24, once again, Jesus says, if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, this is, of course, Old Testament terminology. Now we attend church. We don't attend the temple as they did in the time of Christ. So if you are presenting a sacrifice, and we don't present sacrifices anymore because Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, not that you have something against someone, but someone has something against you, Leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. In other words, Jesus is saying, if you come to church today and you know someone has something against you, the sense of urgency should be so great that you actually get up, leave, go be reconciled with that person, and then come back and offer your sacrifice to the Lord, which is ourselves, that we present ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable form of worship. In other words, Jesus is emphasizing maybe through hyperbole, maybe through an exaggeration. Now, we're to take Jesus seriously, but we're not to take everything he said seriously. Did you hear that? We're to take Jesus seriously, but not everything he said do we take literally. For example, when he said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. He's not telling you to literally go do that. It's hyperbole. It's an exaggeration to prove an important spiritual point. He said, if your hand offends you, cut it off. He's not literally telling you to cut off your hand, okay? So he's not literally saying, you know, leave church and go make peace with somebody. But he's saying this is so, such an important urgency that you need to prioritize it in your life. 
Now look at what Hebrews 12, 14 says, and let's read this verse out loud together. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. One translation says, to the best of your ability, be at peace with all men. To the best, try your hardest to be at peace with everyone. We know it's not always possible. This is one manifestation of the holiness of God in your life. Keeping the Ten Commandments is, is a manifestation or evidence of the holiness of God in our life. You know, being more godly instead of godless, godlike, imitator of God, as a dearly loved child, that's practicing holiness. Holiness is a life of separation, living a life separate from the world. All of that is holiness, but according to the writer of Hebrews, in this verse, one context, one way to define holiness is that you're making an effort an effort in your life to be at peace with everyone. Now, that's not realistic because some people don't want to be at peace with you. Somebody want to be at war with you. Some people don't like you, and no matter what you do, they will never like you. But to the best of your ability, so that you're living free from that person's negative influence in your life, you need to strive to be at peace. For Jesus, nothing is more important than reconciliation resolution of disputes and the repairing of broken relationships. So the question today is, who are you out of sorts with in your life? You know, I believe we're the most offended generation of all time. The easiest things offend us. We are the cancel culture. Oh, and I could go off on this. I guess I'll have to save it for a worldview segment, okay? But Paul said we're to live each day with a conscience void of offense before God and man. We can't go through life with a chip on our shoulder. We can't be so easily offended. We can't live with our emotions on our sleeves. But we're so quick to cancel people. Reconciliation is important. Making sure that our relationships are intact is important. The way you leave one relationship is the way you're going to enter another relationship. The way you leave one job is going to the way you're going to enter another job. The way you leave one church is the way you're going to enter into another church. And so we need to do our best, strive to be at peace with all men. Don't ever leave a job angry. Don't ever leave a job bitter. Maybe you had to turn in your resignation. Maybe you got terminated. Don't go through life blaming, playing the blame game. If you want God's further favor and blessing on your life, sometimes you just have to accept defeat, accept failure momentarily. You lose a round, but you're going to win the, the, the battle. You're going to lose a battle to win the war. You're going to lose a round, but you're going to win the fight at the end of the day. Sometimes you have to shake the dust uh, off of your feet and just move on and believe if one door is shut, another door is going to open, but you have to keep your heart right if you want God to continue to bless you. God forbid if you ever have to go through a a, a broken heart through the ending of a relationship or even worse, God forbid, the ending of a marriage relationship. Sometimes that happens. You can't go through life, the rest of your life, being angry and being bitter. Maybe you were completely done wrong. Maybe the person never admitted they're wrong. Maybe it's an ongoing struggle. My friend, for your sake, for, your, for the sake of your relationship with God and your relationship with others and your future relationships and the relationship with your children, if there are any children, keep your heart clean. Don't let it get defiled and don't let a root of bitterness just spring up within you. Let it go. Walk in grace. Walk in mercy. Walk in forgiveness. You know, once a month we have a, we have a membership class. And, uh, you know, last Sunday we, we had our growth track, number one. And I was in there just to greet everybody, welcome everybody. We had about 40 people, I guess, that believe God's calling them to be a part of Trinity Church. And part of, of the growth track is we want to officially inter introduce ourselves to you. We want you to introduce yourself to us. We want you to know that membership here is based on a relationship with Christ and through Christ with one another. And uh, we want to understand the vision, the mission, and the values that we're aligned accordingly so that we can just have a, a healthy, productive relationship moving forward. But uh, inevitably, people are moving from one church to another church. Sometimes they're brand new to the faith or sometimes they're brand new to the city and they start attending here. But we want to make sure that when they are, if they're leaving another church, that they're just leaving on good terms. Sometimes, you know, uh, you're, in, you're in a new season spiritually and you decide to start attending here or, or maybe things didn't go well in your former church. We just need to make sure that you leave with the right heart because the way you leave is the way you enter. So sometimes people leave churches to go to another church. Now, on a side note, I don't know why anyone would want to leave Trinity Church to go to another church, but hey, that's your business between you and God, right? But we welcome them. We welcome you. 
And we just want to make sure that we're, we're all starting off on the right foot. Once again, reconciliation. Do you need to be reconciled with anything or anyone in your life? Take care of it as quickly as possible. There's a story in Genesis. Many of you are familiar with the story of Jacob and Esau. They were twins born uh, from uh, Isaac and Rebekah. And you know the story of Jacob. He was, a, he was a swindler. He was a con man. He was a fraudster. He tricked his brother and stole his, his blessing and his inheritance. He deceived his own father. And uh, because he stole the blessing from Esau, and you might know the story. If not, you can read it there in Genesis. He had to flee because his brother Esau said, I'm going to kill him. So he fled and he lived with his uncle Laban for 20 years, married two of his daughters. <laughs> That's when polygamy was accepted. Not the perfect will of God, but it was accepted. And he lived there for 20 years. And now, because he's such a major player in the Bible, he is a player in Scripture, in the story of redemption, he had to go back to the Holy Land. But there's Esau. And as his journey begins to go back with his wives, his kids, and you know, all of his, the whole, his whole clan, his brother is, is uh, traveling to meet him, and it's told him Esau's coming with 200 men. If you're traveling with 200 men, you know what your intent is, right? To, to, to exact vengeance. So the night before Esau meets, Jacob meets with his brother Esau, he has this incredible encounter with God, a wrestling match with God on the Jabbok River bed, the bank of the Jabbok River. And if there's so many spiritual truths that are from this moment in Scripture. And uh, I did a sermon on this about 10, 12 years ago. I, I need to preach it again. But anyway, one of the spiritual applications of this wrestling match, when Jacob finally taps out, God wins, he always wins, his nature has changed. He goes from being Jacob to Israel, from being a deceiver, the name Jacob means supplanter, deceiver, to Israel, prince with God. Something changes in him. His nature changes. And it was kind of metaphorical or symbolic of his struggle with his own guilt all these years because he did wrong he wronged his brother he wronged his father and only god can take that which was meant for evil and use it for good some it's the means that justifies the end in this case the end was right he was to be the one blessed but his means to get it was all wrong but god in his sovereign grace was able to transform that and use it for good. But now he's got to make things right with Esau. Esau's you know, got vengeance in his eyes. So when he meets his brother, he's a different man now. There's this humility and vulnerability, and he basically, out of reverence and respect, bows before his brother. And they have this moment of brother-to-brother -brother reconciliation. And Esau, instead of enacting vengeance, forgives Jacob, and they are reconciled. Now listen to this very, very carefully. Sometimes a relationship can experience reconciliation but not restoration. There's a difference between reconciliation and restoration. To reconcile is to bring back in harmony a, harmony, a relationship that, is al that it already exists. To re reconcile and restore a relationship is to reestablish a relationship that no longer exists, cease to exist, was severed because of neglect or design. Let me give an example. God forbid that you ever go through a divorce. But if you go through a divorce, and let's say both of you get remarried, but you still have children that you share together, and your lives are going to be intertwined for the rest of your lives, it's important that you get along for your own sake, for the sake of the kids. So that relationship can be reconciled but not restored. You could begin to be kind and compassionate and more agreeable with one another in the best interests of the kids, but you're not going to get married again. It's not like you're going to divorce the people you're currently married to to get back with your original husband and wife. How many know that would be totally confusing and complicated, and that would not be God's will? Accept it for as it is, and God can bless it where it's at right now. So you can be reconciled, but you can't be restored. And then at the end of the day, we all have a ministry of reconciliation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, Paul said, God reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave all of us the ministry of reconciliation. One, uh, one scholar, one New Testament scholar, Richard Hayes from the Duke Divinity School and the Center for Reconciliation, he defines reconciliation as dispute resolution. He actually says in his writings, that reconciliation is more a political term than it is a religious term. And it means dispute resolution. If you're in dispute with somebody, 
you want to bring it to resolution, Jesus said, as quickly as possible. Hopefully, prayerfully, you can do it without having to go to court. The word actually references diplomatic reconciliation between warring nations, what we're hoping and praying for between Russia and Ukraine right now. But it also applies here scripturally in personal relationships. When there's an estrangement or a, a broken relationship between a husband and a wife. Admission, reconciliation, which leads number three to forgiveness. And we all need forgiveness because we're so easily offended and people, they get mad and they, they leave a church, you know. They just get mad and leave a church, you know, for really no good reasons. I heard the story of a guy that was stranded on an island by himself. He was on an island, stranded by himself, and the Coast Guard finally found him and they came to rescue him. And when they rescued him, they noticed that there were three huts that he had built. And they said, are you here on the island alone? And the guy said, yes, I've been here alone the entire time. He said, why do you have three huts? He said, I live in that one. I go to church to that one, and I used to go to church at that one. <laughs> Admission, reconciliation, and finally forgiveness. Look at Matthew 6, 14 and 15. This is a continuation of the Sermon on the Mount. Let's read these verses out loud together. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Wow. There's a lot of unforgiven sin in the body of Christ globally today in churches all over the world because you're carrying sin that God won't forgive unless you're willing to forgive others of their sin against you. Probably next, next to the word love, forgiveness is the most important word in our vocabulary. You see, we're all flawed human beings. The fault line of sin runs through all of us. We all make mistakes. Broken relationships can be repaired. Not always, but in most cases, over time, they can. If not restored, at least reconciled. And we need to speak honestly. We need to confess our sins to God and to others so that we can give and receive forgiveness. But here's the question. How do you forgive someone that's not sorry for what they've done? Can you actually forgive somebody like that? Yes, you can. Uh, Rachel Wil Wilkerson Miller uh, wrote a blog, How to Forgive Someone Who Isn't Sorry. And she actually quotes from Robert Enright, who is a professor of education and psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and is the leader, get this, of the scientific study of forgiveness. And Laura Davis is an author of several books about the estrangement and reconciliation of relationships. Both Enright and Davis say that forgiving someone who is unrepentant is absolutely possible. Actually, it's necessary. And in some ways, it's easier to define forgiveness by what it isn't. And forgiveness is not exonerating or excusing what somebody else did to you. That behavior was wrong. What they did to you was wrong, and it will always be wrong. But both Enright and Davis say that forgiveness exists separately from reconciliation and also from accountability, that we're not seeking necessarily restitution or definitely not retribution or not even restoration, sometimes not even reconciliation. We're simply saying, I'm going to release this person from the sin they committed against me because I do not want to live the rest of my life entangled in unforgiveness and bitterness related to what this person did to me. Jesus on the cross of Calvary of the seven final statements that came out of his mouth, one of those famous statements was this, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Even if they're not asking for forgiveness, you deserve it before God for your sake and Christ's sake to forgive everyone and anyone that's ever hurt you in any way. And if the relationship can be reconciled, great. If not, great. If it can be restored or needs to be restored or should be restored because there was a prior relationship and it can be, great. If not, great. But walk in forgiveness. Have your conscience void of offense before God and man. Many, many, many years ago, there was a really good conservative pope of the Catholic Church, and they attempted to commit, they, they attempted to kill him once. An assassin tried to assassinate him. And they asked the pope afterwards, they said to the pope, do you forgive the man that tried to murder you? He said, I forgive him, but I won't be having dinner with him anytime soon. Okay? So there's a difference in forgiveness and trying to reconcile 
or restore. And I want to close with two illustrations. First of all, John Newton. (laughs) John Newton is one of the most famous Christians that's ever lived. He was a former slave trader. You think the sin of slavery is bad? There's something even worse, being a slave trader. And that's who John Newton was. And he had his own Damascus, road to Damascus encounter with Jesus Christ. And he was gloriously saved. And he repented of his sin. He became an abolitionist. He began to fight against slavery. He became an Anglican cleric. And he wrote the most famous hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was blind, but now I see he was lost, but now I'm found. He wrote Amazing Grace. This man that was broken over his sin received God's grace. And then he started to practice and do something. Every Saturday night before Sunday worship, this is what John Newton would do. First part was he would make two lists. On one list, he would list all the mercies and blessings and good things to be thankful for that had happened to him that week, and he would write them down. The second list were all the sins of omission and commission that he had committed against others and against God. And then he would reflect on the discrepancy between the good and the bad. And he never tried to work for his salvation. He knew that for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. He wrote a song about how amazing that grace, undeserving grace is. But he wanted to put his life in perspective. And the third thing he did is he would rededicate his life and allow his life to experience refreshing and renewal by recommitting to God and God's promises, leaning on God's grace, asking for forgiveness, admitting where he was wrong, practicing the ministry of reconciliation to ensure that his relationship with God was always at its peak and always stayed in a state of renewal and restoration. And the way we do that is to understand that God is always present. And even though God knows everything about you, he still loves you. He knows things about you that nobody else knows about you. And yet it doesn't diminish the fact that he loves you and that his mercies are new every morning. You know, every vehicle here at Trinity Church that's owned by the church, the school and the church, we have video cameras in them now. They're two-way, external and internal. And they record speed. They make sure that if you're driving with that precious cargo, our students to and from a game or out of town, they make sure that you're not texting. And if you do, it will send a, uh, a notification to, I guess, Dr. Cox, I don't know. So Friday, I borrowed one of our church vehicles. I borrowed a truck and I got in it and I saw this, I mean, this like high-tech camera stuck, you know, right? beneath the the mirror. And I'm like, I better be in my best behavior. Someone's watching me. I got in the truck and I got on loop 289 and, you know, I'm driving 65, 65, 65, sometimes seven. I go, oh, they're going to get a text. I'm going over. I mean, it's that, it's that technical. And then if my phone buzzed, I didn't look at it. I looked at my watch, but I didn't look at it. And I remembered, you know, they're watching me right now. I, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Forget that person just cut me out. You idiot. Oh, Jesus said, don't even call somebody an idiot. Okay, bless them, Lord. Where'd they get their driver's license, you know? And it's amazing when you think, and in this case, you know somebody's watching, you're like, okay, I better up my game, right? Here's the thing. God's always watching. Nothing that you think Nothing that you say, nothing that you do surprises him. He has seen it all, okay? But he still loves you. And he's calling each of us into deeper relationship with him. For all of us to be committed on that path, that path of spiritual progress, that path of spiritual growth that leads to maturity. Are you on that path today? Have you admitted and are you willing to admit when you're wrong? Are you practicing the ministry of reconciliation And are you walking in forgiveness? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we humbly come before you today. I pray for relationships that have been wounded, hurt, or even broken. I pray the restorative power of the Holy Spirit to be at work in those relationships that should be and need to be restored. For those relationships that should be and need to be reconciled. I know, Lord, there are times some relationships need to be cut off. But the most important relationship is our relationship with you that puts all other relationships in perspective. So if you're here today and you need God's grace, 
You need God's mercy. He's one prayer away. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I would encourage you to open up your heart, receive Christ, confess your sins, turn to God in faith. Christ will come into your life by the power of the Holy Spirit and your life will be changed from the inside out. You need to be born again. And if you're here today and you are a Christian, but you're out of fellowship with the Lord and that relationship needs to be restored and reconciled, then let this be a prayer of rededication for you. It's important that you say this prayer with your own mouth and you mean it from your own heart. If number one, you want to get saved, number two, you want to rededicate your life to Christ. Here we go. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a savior. There's only one savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart, come into my life. Be my Lord, be my savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive his love, his grace, and his forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my father, and I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. And give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. God bless you, church.